This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So today we had Rob Carrick as a guest, which was pretty cool. Yeah, so he's a personal finance writer in the Globe and Mail and has oh, been. Oh, come on, everyone knows who Rob for, is. For years. And when he told the story, and I, I had not remembered this at all, but talked about the roaring 90s for mutual funds where people used to rush out on Saturdays to the mailbox, put your whatever in the box and get your paper, and you had to go early before they're all sold out. I remember getting up early Saturday mornings back like 92, 93 to get my Globe and Mail to get that report on mutual funds. I had forgotten all about that. Because you were so focused on doing what was best for the clients, seriously. Yeah, it's, it's crazy to think back to that, that go-go time of mutual funds and how the world has changed. Yeah, it's so interesting. My personal connection with, well, it's somewhat personal with, with Rob is that he, he wrote an article, I don't even know when it was, a, long, a, a while ago, 2011 maybe, about dimensional fund advisors, just talking about the product and whatever. And I found that article when I was, I was selling actively managed mutual funds and I started Googling around for index funds. When you search for index funds, that's one of the first things that comes up. So I read the article and that, that is what led me to cold call dimensional, which is what led me to PWL eventually, because dimensional answered my call and said, yeah, no, where you are now, we'll never distribute our, our funds. And I was like, okay, that's too bad. And then six months later, they called and said, there's a firm in Ottawa that we work with that's looking for an advisor. Would you be interested in a connection? And so they introduced me to Cameron. Yeah. Cool story. Anyways, Rob, very good interview. He's a wise person who's got an interesting perspective in that he studied the industry, but he's also had probably thousands of questions from readers. Oh, he's deep in the trenches. So he's got the perspective on both sides and that that wisdom just from grinding it out for years is fascinating. We, we said uh, in the episode that we could have kept talking for hours and Rob afterwards said that he'd be happy to come back to do a, a follow-up episode, which I think we'll, we'll probably do because it, it was a great conversation. Enjoy. All right, here you go. Rob, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thanks, Ben. We're, we're really excited to have you here. Very much so. So uh, the first thing I want to ask you, Rob, is what is the most common question that you get from readers? I mean, you must get a ton of questions. Well, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different themes right now. For instance, ETFs, very, very big. A lot of people want to know about ETFs. They're really struggling to get a handle on it, but they know that that's something that sounds good to them. I'm getting a lot of questions now about financial advice. People want advice and they're they're interested in getting it in different formats. Can I recommend an advisor? Can I recommend like a planner? That sort of thing. I get I get asked to, you know, basically people think I have this secret pool of preferred people and I will just connect them with them. And I'm very leery of doing that. But occasionally in certain circumstances, I will say I know some good people and I don't recommend them, but I say you might want to include them in your in your investigation. So there's the ETFs, there's financial advice, and then there's just the random financial question that I have. And if people they, they seem to have not heard of Google in some cases, because a lot of these questions I myself answer with Google, and a lot of times they're um, fairly complex uh, questions that probably should be taken to an expert, an advisor, an accountant a lawyer in some cases. So, uh, but people, the, what I take out of this is there's a huge hunger for information, tons of questions and as much information as there is on the internet, it's not connecting with people. It's too much. It's not written in a comprehensible way. It's contradicted by the next thing they read and they're not satisfied. And so they're looking for experts. You know, they, they, they people they trust, they trust me. I often suggest go find an advisor you can trust and you can take all your questions to them on a continuing basis. But, you know, there's a bit of a disconnect there. There are people out there who need advisors who don't have them. So interesting. So I, I've been following and reading articles for years and I've liked your perspective very much over the years. I'm curious to know, has your what has been your biggest perhaps shift in thinking around money since you started writing about this? Well, when I started my column back about 20 years ago, there was a lot of people speaking out about like bad stuff that advisors were doing, um, you know, particularly in the mutual fund world. And 
they weren't advisors, they were salespeople. And I sort of got influenced by that and started to take a strong DIY kind of approach. This is back in the load days, I'm presuming. Oh yeah. This is back in the mutual fund heyday mm. years, back when the Globe Mail had a special monthly section on mutual funds and it would sell it well. out. Wow. Could, well, yeah. yeah. People would say, I couldn't get a copy in the box wow. near me because there was a run on it. Mutual funds were like cannabis stocks are today, okay? Wow. They were stars. Anyway, so the advisory <laughs> world was still in its sell, sell, sell mode back then. And I was really influenced by a lot of the complaints I was hearing. And I became not anti-advisor, but very skeptical about it. And I thought there are good advisors out there, but I, I really need to protect people from the, from the bad ones. And um, my evolution now is that I continue to think that the profession is being, its reputation could be enhanced if certain members of it were to be uh, kicked out. But by and large, I think more people need advisors. And I think my job is, I think, is to help people understand that there's more to investing than costs. And that when you have an advisor, it's not just overhead, it's value in, a, in an ideal situation. And I've, that's, so that's one of my biggest shifts. I went from sort of being a big advice skeptic to an advice booster when I think it's a good fit for people. And I think more people don't realize how good a fit it could be. It's interesting. You know, that's the, Dan, Dan Bordelotti went through this, a very similar transition where he was very DIY, pro-DIY, anti-advice. And then as he started hearing from people interacting with his readers, transitioned to being more you know, pro-advice. Part, part of it is that I see, the pro, I see the advice business itself evolving. There's a lot more attention on planning, on holistic uh, advice. There's more good people and good firms out there than there used to be. And I have less trouble identifying them than I used to. There's still a lot of emphasis on there's still a lot of emphasis on selling and a lot of really incompetent bad advice and I see it because people tell me what they were told or I used to do a video series called um, Portfolio Checkup where people would sort of send us their statements mm -hmm. and I and an advisor would, would sort of riff on it and say well this stands out and this stands out and hmm. some of the stuff I saw was like I cannot believe this like there are there are supervisors in this in this office this is the, I mean it's not wasn't it wasn't five alarm illegal or unethical. It was sloppy. It was uninformed. It was uh, counterproductive. And I think anybody half familiar with good practices would have said, no, no, we need to gut this portfolio and get back to basics, you know? So, um, so I know there is still a lot of silly stuff going on, but I think the industry and the best people are slowly realizing that there's a huge business opportunity out there of people who need ethical, conscientious uh, planning and investment advice all wrapped together. And it's out there. And I, and I'm trying to help people find it. Yeah, that's really interesting. What What's your favorite topic to write about? What do you get excited to write about? Well, up until a little while ago, it was housing. And the reason was that I just found that people were so religious about housing. They, they were... Mm -hmm believe that housing was the right place for their money and they believe that no amount of financial pain wasn't justified by the end goal of owning a house and that not you know all obstacles were not you know could be surmounted in in, in the greater goal of owning a house and I enjoyed being the skeptic on that because it was because people just kept saying, "Oh, come on, oh, come on." But I found that um, that they have. I was just reading a, an online uh, article today that apparently mortgage growth is at the lowest in, like in decades, and I think it's less fun being the housing skeptic now because people are a lot. People are starting to come back to earth on housing, so it's people aren't quite as crazy about it anymore. And, and so I've got to really? find. Really? Yeah, I, I I do think so. Yes. So are people getting more respect now for renting? No. No. You know what? Renting never had its moment because here's, here's part of the problem. In the cities with strong housing markets, the rental market is insane. Yes. So you can't just say, well, you, yeah, I can see how expensive a house is. You should go rent. So when I rent, I'm paying an astronomical amount. It's still a very high percentage of my income. Often I'm renting a place that's uh, put out there by an investor who says after uh, six months, you know what? I'm selling this place. See ya. And so you've, you've got a precarious rental situation, you've got high percentage re increases in rent, and the rents are high to begin with. So I, I'm, as a personal finance guy, I'm, I'm about solutions, and I have trouble telling people what the solution is in like a, in a Vancouver or a Toronto or the surrounding cities. And I'll tell you, Ottawa has the hottest housing market in the country right now, and it's still nothing compared to what Toronto was in its heyday. But, you know, uh, 
a little bit longer of this and you're going to start to see rents starting to rise and then you're going to be able – then young people are going to have the same problem. They're going to say, yeah, I can rent but it's very expensive and I can't save the money to eventually build my home down payment. Now, I always tell people regardless, if it's a high rent, it's still less than owning a house. But you know, most people just do rent compared to the mortgage payment. Right. Instead of the total the total unrecoverable costs of homeownership, which we've talked about in this podcast in the past. Rob, do you think that in general, do you think that Canadians have a healthy relationship with money? No. I think the relationship with money is as unhealthy as it's ever been. Wow. I'll back this up by saying how much financial stress seems to be a big theme right now. I'm actually working on a project about this. I'm trying to document why Economists say the economy is doing reasonably well, not spectacularly. Maybe it's slowing, but it's doing okay. Unemployment at a – I've been covering economics for about 25 years. Unemployment's at a staggeringly low rate on a historical basis. Wage increases aren't great, but you know they're, keep, they're more or less in the range with inflation. House, most people have made a lot in housing. Stock markets over the past five years have done pretty well, even if last year wasn't that bad. And yet polls continually show people are stressed about money. People who are in the corporate world say, money stress is impacting productivity at work. I mean, you're starting to see companies introduce like uh, financial counseling and credit counseling and financial planning services for employees to get their heads out of their money and into their into their job. And I'm working on trying to figure out what's going on here. But that tells me people, they're spending too much and they're not saving enough and they know it, but they don't know how to get out of it. So you're saying the worry is justified. Totally justified. I think it is. When you look at debt levels, I think that people, not everybody's in, uh, not everybody's in debt, but those who are, are worried about it. They see interest rates rising. They don't see the job market giving them the great new position or the bonus or the uh, promotion to help them, to help salary get them out of their problems. They're worried about their kids affording a house. They're worried about their own retirement and maybe not having saved enough money and maybe they don't have a pension or they only had a pension for part of their career. I think the, the stress isn't made up. It's real. I'm just trying to figure out how we got into this predicament given that we never had the worst of that last recession in the global financial crisis. Canada came out as well as any country in the world. You know, the US had this, you know, catastrophic housing crash. They rebounded quite well and here we are. We never had the big crash. It's almost like we're getting ours in bits and pieces and we're still in the process of, you know, of adjusting to a new a new financial reality. And how would you compare those money worries to other worries? Say they're their health or their relationship or I mean everyone's talking about well-being these days. Right. Well, I was talking to uh, I was talking to some workplace uh, experts recently and they said that money worries were the second biggest thing on people's minds next to I believe it was uh, actually it was more like the number one was sort of like this existential feeling of not being happy, feeling disconnected from community and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Uh, but money was number two ahead of health, ahead of family considerations and etc and I thought given that we're not in bad bad, we're not in bad straits right now. You know, there's not a lot you can say it's terrible out there, uh, and yet people are are feeling like it is. Do you think there's anything that people are worrying about too much that is not warranted financially? No, not really. Um, because a lot of the a lot of the issues are debt. I can't just deny debt is a is a big problem. And there's a lot of there's an interconnectedness in family in families uh, and financial problems right now. It's the whole sandwich generation issue. You know, you've got two you've got yourself, but you've got two other fronts to worry about. A lot of boomers have adult kids who need some sort of financial assistance, or at least their parents perceive that they do. And then they've got aging parents. And this is, I think, an emerging theme. I'm just starting to hear. I'm off. I got my ear to the ground, listening to what trends are, and I hear a story, and then I hear another story, and I think, oh, that's interesting. But two stories don't make a trend. But you hear a few more, and all of a sudden, you start to get more interested in. And one of those uh, trends that is just starting to gel a little bit is the boomer who has to help their adult parent, their aged parents, with expenses. And it could take all a number of different forms, just as it does with helping, you know, your millennial kids. A lot of them are parents are running out of money They're, and their kids are having to – I was talking to a guy on the bus the other day. He recognized me and he said, oh, we got to talking about things and he was probably in his 30s. He said him and his wife were looking at what were they going to do to help support his wife's parents. 
and who lived in Niagara Falls and they had basically run a business and hadn't been able to save a lot. And I'm thinking this is, uh, this is something that I really have to start looking into. There's not a lot of stats on it, but I'm quite interested. And so it's just another pressure point. So let's go back to investing again. So, I mean, I was reading you, as you said earlier, when the mutual fund explosion was happening in the 90s, and now we have a similar explosion in ETFs and more awareness around passive investing and whatnot. Can you talk about how your investment philosophy, if it has shifted, has changed over the years? I was writing about ETFs when they were still index participation units, you know, hips and tips, mm -hmm. and something resonated at about them to me. And, you know, basically that was just, there was probably like 12 people in Canada who owned them. They were super cheap. And then I remember when I think it was Barclays and Dow Jones were dueling it out to who would have sort of like Canadian market ETF and the TSX sort of handed it off to these companies. And I used to write a column every time a new ETF was, was introduced because it was so, the first bond ETF. Now you can invest in the S&P 500. And it was like mo monumental because it was like- You stopped doing that? I did because otherwise I'd never write about anything else because there's an ETF popped out about every five minutes now. I'm a big believer in indexing. Part of my own money is indexed. Part of it is managed. I think it is a awesome way for the masses to invest. I'm really impressed with how people are picking up on it before. Like individual investors used to fight the concept, I can do better. My mutual fund can do better. Now they're saying more and more. I'm happy to make what the index makes minus these minuscule fees. And if I have advice, I'll pay another 50, 100, 125 basis points for that. But that is a whole separate thing. That's for advice. My investments are locked down for a very low cost. So I think public openness to it is at the highest level ever. And that's why you see ETF assets growing and why you see um, the ETF companies really um, – shifting their attention to the advisory community because there's a lot of people in the advisory community who have still to be uh, convinced that ETFs are a good thing. I believe indexing is its early innings yet. I think it has a long way to go in Canada. There's a lot of talk about you know the, you know, the momentum it has, but when you look at the assets compared to mutual funds, I think it's just up to 10% now. Oh, it's tiny, yeah. On the topic of ETFs, here's a stat. There were, there were 140 new ETFs launched in Canada last year in 2018. Do you think that all that choice in these relatively low cost investment options, is that choice helping or hurting Canadian investors? Hurting. Big time hurting. People are just swamped. They just like, they cannot make sense of it at all. Uh, and, you know, I see what what the ETF industry is doing is just what the mutual fund industry did, you know, 20, 30 years ago. There wasn't a trend they wouldn't spin a fund out on. They could do it uh, really quickly. It's hard to track these funds because they're all gone. They've all been round up or folded into other funds. You know, I remember the big science and technology fund craze in you know, 1999 <laughs> and 2000. How many of those are still left? Um, the biotech funds, you know. The I, boomer I, funds. The boomer funds, the Harry Dent demographer funds. You know, it was just, there was every every theme un under the sun. And I think the ETF industry is is just as bad in trend riding as the fund industry was. And it might even be a little bit worse because ETFs are so easy to trade, you know. So you think, well, mutual funds were sort of cumbersome. You had to, you know, trade, uh, buy and sell them at end of day values. You couldn't really, they weren't really set up for this. But ETFs really encourage that sort of thing. So I remember, remember last um, last January when all the online brokerages were being like ground to a halt by trading volumes. It was all just speculation on cannabis stocks. And the ETF company said, we got to get a piece of that action. And they did. I don't think the trend ETFs are help. I'm a skeptic on the fundamental index indexing ETFs because they cost more. I'm not convinced they outperform the regular cap weighted indexes. The actively managed, there's a few of them that, that seem to be making a case for themselves. But to me, um, there's only one really good new trend that I'm really, really like, and that is the balanced ETFs. Really oh, yeah. like those. Yeah. Those are really cool products. And, and the poor term mutual fund has absolutely been decimated in the marketplace. I don't think it's it's well founded necessarily. And I think you wrote, you wrote an article about that. Well, you know, I, I sometimes find people like they, they, you know, it's like the, you know, someone who's been recently converted to a cause is very strong on it. And they start to wake up to the fact that mutual funds are expensive and I've been ripped off and they get really angry about it and all mutual funds are bad and mutual funds are expensive. And, and I'm saying, well, actually, I own some mutual funds and they're actually not that expensive. And The structure is a beautiful structure. It's a beautiful structure. It's very well designed for people who want to add money as time goes by. Not all the managers are dummies. Not all the fees are insurmountable in terms of delivering good if you, if you hunt around. So don't go around saying 
all mutual funds are bad because you're doing yourself a disservice. And probably once a week or once every two weeks, I get an email from a reader saying, I own mutual funds and I understand they're very expensive and I want to sell them and I want to get in TTS. I always say, what mutual funds do you own? Did you check how they're doing? Like, do you even know, like you say they're expensive, are they? And are, you know, and are they over the long term earning you a, a decent rate of return connected to the risk you've under, you know, you've gone through? And most times they don't know. Oh, I'll have to go check that. Thank you. You know, I basically I've given them an like they've they've decided to make this jump off the precipice into something they don't understand, like ETFs or whatever. And I basically said you might be okay where you are. Now I'm I'm expecting that probably two thirds to three quarters will think, oh no, I'm actually not. This isn't any good, and they'll move. But um, I want people to understand. I, I mean, I, I I don't like black and white. I don't like people saying all mutual funds are bad, all ETFs are good. Right. Far from it. You know what? I mean, it's a complex world out there. And if I, if you tell people that everything's so simple and black and white, they will start making a spur of the moment bad decisions. I'll just get any ETFs because mutual funds are bad. My favorite example is the TDE series mutual funds, which are mutual funds, but they're low cost index mutual funds. A very, very good product that TD does its best to hide and to never praise or never market to anybody. They're a very good mutual fund product. You know, there's a few good fun, there's a few good low cost mutual fund families out there that manage money for a very reasonable cost. And over the long term, they do very, very good work. And you know what? They don't need to go and advertise to people because people find them. Like Maurer and we know Vanguard just launched some active ETFs. It's true. If you want active risk, there are pretty cheap ways to get it. It kind of disappoints me, points me when I see Vanguard getting into to these uh, other types of ETS because I know why they're doing it. They're a business, even if they're you know they're investor owned, they still need to to do well. And I guess they they can't have an empty shelf for a product that everybody's talking about. But I I I do wish that someone would say, you know what, we believe in core stuff, and that's all we're doing. We do it very well. We sell it very cheaply. Here it is. Yeah. Earlier in the episode, we talked about the burden that aging parents might might have on their kids, and I do want to ask a question about that in a second, but. At the other end of the spectrum, what do you think that parents can be doing to teach their kids, their, their younger kids, or maybe even young adult kids, kids about money? You know, I think the biggest thing you can do for your kid is to teach them to spend less than they have. Whatever you have, s save some of it back. Living within your means is the most important personal finance skill of all because from that comes investing and saving and all, all that sort of stuff. So you have to teach someone... Some people have it naturally. Like I have two sons. They're one's 21 and one's 24. One's a natural saver. One's more of a spender. But my 24-year-old, he's working now and uh, he's like saving scads of money and I'm really impressed. And you know what? And I think I've talked to him over and over without trying to lecture too much about, you know, that, you know what? Don't spend it all. When he was younger and you, he had like five bucks, he would spend five bucks. I do think kids are teachable. I do think they all have their own money, natural money personalities and you have to see what it is and let them make a few mistakes first. Don't take the hard line and, and, and be a killjoy. Let them, let them waste their money and learn, wow, I wasted my money. Uh, and that, that's the best lesson you can teach them. But by and large, it's how much do you have? How much are we going to keep back of that? And start really young with allowances and birthday presents. Build the idea that, we, that whatever I have, I'm going to save a bit of it back. That puts someone on, the, on, a, on a really good track, I think, for, uh, for a financially prosperous life. I'm cu curious how you did it. Did you do the, the teaching to them as a percentage of what they make? Or like with my son, I said, look, you have to save your RSP limit and your TFSA limit. So he has an absolute dollar number each year to strive for. I'm curious if you have any experience on that. My son's working a, a contract for, for a federal government agency and it's basically it's been doled out like in four month chunks. So, and I'm telling him, save everything you can because you don't know how what's going to happen after this is over. So we'll worry about the fine tuning of where the money goes. But right now you need to, you need to, what happens if you don't have any work for a while? What resources do you have? So basically I'm just saying, fill up the savings bucket, Mac, to, to as much as you can. And from there we'll worry. But for someone who has a regular job, I think that, I think the, the, the discipline of doing that is important. But, you know, young people, are, are different from, I'm 56 and today's young people are, have a much different mindset than when I did. There's like three forks in the road where they might go at a certain point. Once they're into the workforce, you know, they're earning a good income and it's reliable. Buy a house, okay, you've got to really start directing tons of resources into that. Do you want to travel? A lot of, a lot of young people want to work for a while and travel. A lot of them want to go back and get to upgrade their education. So I'm thinking, 
we sometimes think about having an emergency fund and then you're saving for retirement. But I think there's sort of an intermediate term savings profile that that they, that young people need to think about. And that dictates where their money goes and into what vehicle. For instance, I might say a TFSA might be good if you are for your intermediate, but don't neglect the retirement. Right. And then of course, there's your short-term savings for your house down payment fund, if that's your thing. And I find you have to be very nimble when, t- when talking to young people about what they want to do, because they want to do things that I didn't actually wasn't thinking about when I was their age. That's interesting. Even just on the topic of, of advice and like all the questions you get from readers, I find just that conversation about buckets, that, that's a that's a 35-minute conversation with somebody. It is. And I think there are more buckets now than there were 20, 30 years ago. And I think there may be more buckets yet because, you know, the, the, the workforce isn't – it's just not about getting a job and working in your profession and maybe you go to another company in the same field. That world is is, is receding. And in a world of precarious or temporary or contract or gig work, people might just want to say – just as the workforce doesn't want to give me a full time long stretch of work, I might choose to take a little break in the middle, and like maybe I will, maybe I'll get a master's, maybe I'll get a go to a college and get a one year certificate to enhance my credentials. Uh, maybe I'll travel for a while, I'll take a sabbatical. Um, this whole fire movement. Oh, yeah. Can you can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, fire for uh, financial independence, retire early. I don't think it's really a trend that's really going to has brought mass appeal or mass applicability, but I think it reflects this. I think it's more interesting from for. A, from a sort of a sociological, psychological point of view, what does it say about the times that all these young people, like instead of the boomer generation, young people thought, I let, let me at that career world. I'm just going to rip it apart and build, you know, and put my footprint on it. These people are saying, get me out of there as quick as I can. You know, I'm going to live like a monk for 10 years and then I'm going to retire. Like <laughs> b- would boomers ever say anything like that? No way. They thought, well, I'll have my Audi when I'm 40 and then I will have my cottage. And uh, these people are saying, I'm just going to, I'll just retreat from the world. You know, they, they're just, so I, I think they're seeing this, the workplace as it exists for them is not a great place. And they're thinking, I want to be out of here as quick as I can. They're taking the measures. I think a lot of people, it's just not going to work for them. I just think it's too hard. Yeah. You, you, can, you know, to buy the idea of, of retiring at 30 or 40 or even 50 and amassing enough money to last you till you're 95, you know, in all this relaxation, you're not going to have any stress. You're going to live to be 100 and um, you're going to need savings, like a monumental amount of savings. And a lot of these people haven't really had enough of life to know the curveballs that can be thrown at you. I just don't, I think a lot of them are going to be, their financial independence is going to be of a limited duration. But I think on the other hand, I think if, if young people adapt it though, I'll, I will be independent and in that I can, I'll be able to take a year out now and again. I'll take a sabbatical every seven years or I'll retire at 55, which although, you know, I mean, Freedom 55 is probably, we probably all remember that. Maybe Ben doesn't, but- uh, We sure uh, do. We sure do. Now 55, if I'm living to 95, that's dumb. Who wants to be retired for 40 years? That's a lot. You got to you gotta work hard to finance that. But maybe financial independence, retire early will be 55 when the rest of the population is working till 70 or something like that. So I think it's interesting to me. I think it's, it's just an insurmountable obstacle for a lot of people. And I think- I think they're going to really be disappointed when they engage with how hard it is. So let's talk about that shift for boomers into their spending years now that the saving years for many of them are behind them. What do you hear from readers? How do you view this whole evolution that's going to be happening for many people going from the saving to the spending years? You know, that the decumulation years? Yeah. I think people, it's a black hole. I don't think there's nearly enough information for people out there about decumulation. I mean, everything is focused on saving, 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 building up your RSP and your TFSA. Only now in the past year or two or three have I started to see more people writing and offering opinions on decumulation. I think um, I got tons of questions from readers like withdrawal rates and should I, what should I cash in first? And when should I take my CPP? There needs to be a lot more talk about this. Uh, and a lot more advice on this. And I'm amazed that nobody in the advice business is capitalizing on this. Why is there no retirement advice corporation in, in saying, we specialize in retirees. You come to us five years before your retirement and we have your back. You tell us what you want to do, we'll do it. We're not going to guide you all the way from 20 to 65. We are basically, we are your retirement wingman. 
Nobody's doing it, but there's- People are doing it, but they're not branding it, I guess. Well, they're not branding it like that. Of course, everybody's doing it in their practice, yeah. but these are long time clients, but there's a whole pool of people sitting out there at age 55 going, what the heck do I do now? And I'm, people send me, oh, can you send me a link for a retirement calculator? <laughs> I can, but I think there's probably a touch more to it than that, you know. And so anyway, I think the decumulation years are huge. It's it, we're at the thin edge of the wedge now because the boomer generation has just started retiring a few years ago. I think it's a monumental opportunity for advice providers. And I think, see, I'm not in the advice business, but I understand it. But I also understand the minds of the clientele, maybe better than some advice firms do. And I think mm -hmm. the advice business has its track that it's on about how it markets itself and how it brands itself. And it has to get off that track and start thinking like people are consumers of products and services. And we're just a product and service. And how can we resonate with them. I mean, the idea of building wealth and all that stuff, that's great, but that doesn't resonate or it resonates with a limited portion of the population. There's tons of people out there who want, who are ready to decumulate and they don't know how and they'll be making mistakes. And there's a huge opportunity for advice people, advice providers to say, this is how you should do it. And I think what a sense of comfort you'll bring to people. They will pay for it. I think uh, boomers are, uh, as I was saying earlier, boomers are okay with paying for good service to help them make their lives easier. So Rob, I, I would guess, if I had to guess, that you are a DIY investor because obviously you write about this stuff, your head is your, your head is right in it, but you're not a DIY investor. I have a bad habit of collecting financial products and accounts. I, I have way too many and I, I one of my little projects for the next while is to make a list of everything I have so that with information so my wife could deal with it all if, if something happened to me. But I have a robo-advisor account. My wife has a robo-advisor account. I have a uh, I have an account with more mutual funds and I have I don't have any sort of DIY where I buy and sell my own stocks and investments. And the reason is that uh, a couple of years ago I thought I'm not doing my best work on this because I don't have the time. I spend all day writing about this stuff. I do not want to come home and open up my account and start, you know, looking after it. And then I think, oh, I missed opportunities here and there. I should have done this, should have done that. And I thought, this is stupid. I, I need someone to just do this for me. I found more to do that. And I have a financial planner in the city here who uh, my wife and I have seen. So we have that. And the only planner? Fee only plan. Yeah, I just pay. I just pay for the plan, and we have. Um, my wife has an account at a robo advisor, and I have an account at a robo advisor. And oh, actually, I do have a. See, I forgot. I have an online brokerage account where I'm just. I just throw some stuff in now. Again, just I'm using an ETF there, and was averaging into the Canadian market for a while, just thinking it's so undervalued, and it's particularly in December, so I'm just shoveling cash in. It's one of those. It's one of those online brokers that has no commissions to buy ETFs, mm -hmm. so I can dollar cost average at no cost. And so I do that. So I do a little of everything. But the reason is that I, I like to, I need, I need a good solution for me, but I also need to know what people are doing and how does it work. So I've got a couple, of, I own a couple of robo-advisors, online brokers and managed money, et cetera. Can we jump in for just one second to the, the, this, the, the fee only, the flat fee, like hourly type advice, advice model? What do you think about that and how, how is that going to affect the landscape? I think it really resonates with people. I think they're nervous about going to see a financial pro and being told, now you have to buy my investments. But I don't know what I want. I don't know if that's a good deal. Maybe you're selling mutual funds and I'm a bit, I think those are too expensive. They want to see someone who will just sell the advice. I have a, a spreadsheet of people who work on a fee for service basis put together by a blogger and I probably send it out twice a week to people. Sometimes they ask for it. Sometimes they ask about a certain kind of advice. And I say, well, this is something that might help you. I did a, a session for some civil servants uh, a couple of weeks ago. And while I was up on the stage, I was saying, it was about, supposed to be about DIY, DIY investing. But I said, when you're a DIY investor, that doesn't mean you know about financial planning and tax planning and all this stuff. And you can get, you can let that stuff, you can neglect it while you're looking at, well, even while you have a great portfolio. So I said, I if you're going to be a DIY investor, a good add-on is a financial plan that you pay for on an a la carte basis. So I said, I have this spreadsheet and if you would like a copy, just email me and I will be happy to send it to you. And I thought, oh, well, maybe one person will or two, but I had probably between 10 and 20 people and it was happening. I, as soon as I got back to the office, I had a couple of emails and then for the next week or two, they kept coming in and I thought, that's really interesting. 
I said I, I would make this available. It was pro forma. I just did it to cover that off in case someone was interested and lots of people were interested. So it tells me that that's, um, that that is something that really resonates with people. Like a lot of people are, they come to the point in their DIY investing where they think, okay, I've got a portfolio, but what about this financial planning question? RSP versus TFSA. How do I minimize taxes? What should I cash in first when I retire? I think they want the financial plan. Now, some I think might of these people might migrate to the full service type of advisor because they'll think, I like this advice and I want someone to manage my portfolio. Can someone do both? So I think there, there's a lot of room for, for the, the full service outfit and there's a lot of room for the, for the fee for service. And it is uh, five years ago, people said, I can't make a living doing this. Now people are saying, yes, I can make a living doing this. Is that John Robertson's spreadsheet that you're talking yes. about? Yes. Yeah, we can link that in the link, we'll link that in the yeah, show notes. Yeah, it's, it's really good. I, I like it because it's national and people can check up the rates and it's just, it's just, it's like a leads generator. Who can, who are some people who I should check out to see if they, if they fit me? So that's a great setup for, uh, for my last question for you. So we just met for the first time today, even though I feel like we've been working side by side ever since I started in the business because I've been reading your stuff forever. And I'm sure there's lots of people out there that have a similar kind of, call it a relationship with you. They feel like they've known, like I've seen you in town for years, but we've never really met before. So what you do is so interesting in that you've had an impact on many people for so many years. Really curious, how do you define success in your life? I have defined success by writing for an audience of people who tell me that I am helping them. And it happens all the time. I mean, my wife and I were on vacation in St. John's a couple of years ago and a guy came up to me at the St. John's regatta wow. and he said, you know what? You really helped me. I saved so much by moving my mutual funds out of a particular company that I helped me put my kid through university. Wow. And we were with friends and they were just going, oh, I'm like, wow. And I was, I, anyway, I was just thinking, wow, I, really, that makes me feel great. You know, I helped this guy. And I have people stop me on the street to tell me stuff like that. And I was with my wife in, um, in some mall in Ottawa and a guy came up to me and said, you know, I just wanted to say thanks. When, when that's happening, I feel successful. So cool. Good for you. Yep. That's super cool. I could keep talking all day, Rob, but that, uh, we're going to cut it off here uh, to keep the episode within a reasonable time. So thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thanks, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll talk investing with you guys anytime. Uh, have me back and I'll be, I'll be glad to come. Yeah, it's been great awesome. fun. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you.